some things that we have to deal with first when approaching Cosifan Tutte. This would go in the category of a problematic opera, problematic in the sense of what the plot actually does, problematic in the sense of what, what are we supposed to make of it, how are we supposed to make sense out of what this plot entails. And it, it requires, I think, a bit more unpacking from the standpoint of what it takes to really understand what Mozart is trying to do here. Um, and, and it requires a lot too on the side of the production and what the director chooses to do, how the cast members choose to portray their parts. So um, I, I hope that across these two talks, I'll be able to sort of equip you with a skill set and an understanding of this work that you'll be able to get a lot more out of it than you might otherwise. Because again, I think this one does really require um, a lot of time, thought, and effort put into what it is that we're to make of this operatic masterpiece. Lorenzo de Ponte wrote a memoirs of his life in which he has lots to say about everything in most cases. But when it comes to Cosi Fan Tutte, the Ponte is surprisingly um, parsimonious with his description of this work. He does not have near as much to say about where it came from, what they were trying to do. It almost goes by with just a passing mention. In brief, De Ponte describes it this way. It's the quote at the top of the slide. He ranks this work as third place among the three sisters born of that most celebrated father of harmony. You get a sense that this was a work of troubled genesis. But he is, I think, keen to point out that it is really part of a cohesive set of operas that he creates in collaboration with Mozart. So these three works being The Marriage of Figaro from 1786, Don Giovanni from 1787, and then the latest one written just a year before Mozart's death, Così Fan Tutte, premiered in early 1790. So certainly, De Ponte and Mozart see these works as all part of the same project. And despite the very different plots that we find in these three operas, it's clear that they in fact work pretty cohesively as an actual trilogy. Not a trilogy in the sense of recurrent characters, but a trilogy in the sense that every one of these operas seems interested to be exploring the same thematic ideas in their plot materials. We find in all three of these operas, that Mozart and De Ponte are interested in interrogating, on the one hand, the potential for fidelity. That is, can people actually be true to each other? Maybe they can't. Perhaps they can. And then related to that, what happens when they aren't true to each other? That is, what are the ramifications of infidelity? So is it possible to maintain fidelity? And if one doesn't, what are the ramifications of that? Thus, in The Marriage of Figaro, there are all kinds of issues of jealousy and whether one can trust one's spouse, what happens when a spouse loses interest in the relationship, etc. That's what Marriage of Figaro is all about, as you saw last season. Don Giovanni seems to take it to one far extreme. What if we explore a title character who is nothing but a master of infidelity? What happens to him? Well, he gets dragged to hell at the end of the opera. Cosi Fantute, on the other hand, takes sort of less of a mythical stature and instead tries to put it in the household of just normal, average, ordinary people. People who are not yet married. People who were trying to figure out, can they in fact trust their hoped to be future spouses to be true to them over time? So again, it is really a, a tightly conceived collection of operas here. This speaks well, I think, for Cosi Fan Tutte. It is clearly a part of this project. It is interesting that De Ponte thinks of it as the least of the three, however, because in fact, this on some levels appears to be a work that might have been the best of the three. Certainly, Mozart put great stock into what he was doing. And in conceiving of this work, it's worthwhile to start with looking at the original cast that these collaborators were working with. For with only one exception, all of the lead roles, and again, there are only six roles in this opera plus the chorus, all of the roles in this opera, with one exception, were singers that had a 
lengthy experience of having collaborated with Mozart. Mozart knew their voices intimately well. This is a very sort of unusual experience for Mozart. Oftentimes he was working with singers who he had never written before. It was part of the writing process that he would spend time with the cast members, sort of rehearsing their voice, discovering what the potentials of their voice presented to him, and then tailoring the material he wrote for them in, in very particular and specific ways. And I should point out in passing, or perhaps not so much in passing, but um, Miss Adriana here was Lorenzo da Ponte's mistress. So that surely had something to do with why she was cast as the lead female soprano in this opera as well. Um, you might also be curious to know that Mozart had a very low opinion of her voice. So he did not, he did not like her acting or how she sang, but he made it work. You'll notice that the Guglielmo, the, sorry, the Guglielmo Francesco Benucci was the creator of the Figaro role. Lastly, then, a married couple, Francesco and Dorotea Busani, who previously had created roles in Marriage of Figaro, that would be Bartolo and Antonio and Carabino, respectively. And Busani, Mr. Busani, had been around longer than that. He'd also created roles in um, Don Giovanni as well. So Mozart was all over what these voices were capable of. Thus, it is no surprise that we find in this score an intensity and frequency of ensemble singing that goes beyond even what we had already heard in Don Giovanni or in Marriage of Figaro, operas that both have lots more ensembles than would be normal at the time. Here, Mozart even doubles down yet again. There is an incredible proliferation of ensemble singing in this opera, and it seems to be that Mozart understood how well these people work together as a team, and so he knew that he could get away with doing that. At the start, we have two gentlemen who are both happily in love with their fiancés and looking forward to getting married. The pairs at the beginning of the opera are Fiordaligi, paired with Guglielmo, and Dorabella, paired with Ferrando. And again, they're very happy with each other, looking forward to their life ahead. These gentlemen, however, are friends with one Don Alfonso, and he proposes to them a friendly wager. He says, I know what you should do. You should pretend like you're going off to war, come back in disguise, and try to woo the other woman's fiance and see if they will be true to you or not. Our two gentlemen are, of course, wholly convinced that these women are nothing but paragons of virtue and will surely be true to their gentlemen, whereas Don Alfonso is very confident that he's going to win the wager. So they pretend to go off to war. They come back in disguise. In the opera, they come back in disguise as Albanians, which is just essentially shorthand for some exotic place where they dress funny. Um, the reason that they seem to have picked Albanians is because right around this time, the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire is at war with Turkey. And so there was lots of sort of Turkish exoticism going around Vienna at the time. People were really excited about how they dress in Turkey and how funny they look and how they eat different things and all this stuff. And so um, rather than cast them as Turks, because that hits a little too close to home, given that an actual war is actually happening. So they just sort of sidestep it to a neighboring country of Albania. So that's why they come back as Albanians. They woo the other women. And of course, in the end, to make a long story short, Don Alfonso is proved correct. The women do both fall for the alternate suitor in a very short amount of time and are ready to get married by the end of this opera. So there's our test of fidelity and our exploration of the ramifications of infidelity, the themes that are consistent across these three operas. <laughs>